video. Huh? Yeah. The shindig. Um, so, how many people are from out of town? Anybody from out of town? Everybody's from Wilmington? How far? <laughs> My wife wanted me to give a swag bag, an area swag bag, to the farthest from, from this office. So that's kind of difficult. Uh, anybody, anybody? Charlotte, but I don't think I count. This is close. Anybody in CV? <coughs> Carolyn Beach? Nobody? River Road? All right, we'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> thank you for showing up. I appreciate y'all. Um, I've, I've known Gunter since uh, the OG Alexa making the decision to buy a, uh, an Alexa was fairly scary, and he kind of walked me through the steps. And he's been a problem solver ever since. So we're really honored to have him here to talk about the next iteration of Alexa, the Alexa 35. So I'm just going to give the floor to, to you, Mr. Gunter. Thank you, Brad. Yep. <clears throat> so um, I also want to introduce my, my colleague, Caroline. You guys probably met her already in the entrance there. She's based in Atlanta. If you guys need to reach out for any reasons, you can get her number. Um, also, I helped Brad out a few times with cameras, but I don't remember what it was. Typically, there's not much um, support needed for our cameras because they're pretty stable out in the field, but sometimes Turn it's good to know the right person. So um, I've worked for Aerie for 13 years now up in New York. I'm based, um, and I cover the whole East Coast. I mean. But nevertheless, I never came here. This is my first visit to Wilmington. So thanks for having us. And um, today I will talk about three topics. So the first one will be electronic accessories. And I forgot to ask you guys, Brad, do you guys have the high five here? Or yes, no? two, two high fives. Five. Yeah, so high five, um, radio interface adapter, the new modems, uh, the OCU, certain things um, that are now way more complex and um, you can do many, many things. Uh, the second session will be about lenses, primarily the signature primes, which um, I know they don't, they don't exist here because Brad has many other lenses here um, that you guys can work with. And also this is, by the way, my business card. Later it comes up at the end also. You can scan it, you have my number and my email in case that you are somewhere and you need to reach me for or text me with any issues. So um, we'll start with the High Five ecosystem. So this is the High Five, and it came out first, and then we added um, the radio interface adapter, we added the OCU, we added the ZME4. I don't have this ZME4 here, because my colleague Michael Best is right now in Boston doing the same thing, but he has the ZME4 there. So uh, we'll just see pictures of, of this. The Hi5 is the next generation, um, the fifth generation of Airy wireless systems, and it's probably the most modern wireless uh, remote control you can have. You can control cameras from here. You can uh, work with other third-party cameras, Sony, RED, um, you can uh, basically, it's kind of a very valuable tool um, that uh, in today's world, y yeah, you need it. It's kind of the most critical part that there is. Um, and it evolved kind of by improving things that um, we, kn we knew from before that they were not quite there, right? So the adjustment of this tension knob, you can do it now without actually turning the lens motor, right? Because now, right now you can hold it tight and you can adjust the friction here. There's a NATO rail on the top. It's a touch screen where you can also squeeze the, scale, the scales or release the scales based on what, what, how you like them to be. There's more user buttons on here. Um, three user buttons on the back. Um, it's very lightweight and uh, we can change battery 
even on this unit. Um, so if I eject the battery, you see the unit doesn't power down. I put a new battery in there. Um, and it's right there where it was. Right? So these little things, they are very valuable because on, on set sometimes you have to do things quick. Right? There's no time to, there's no time to um, think, so, so to speak. So what we have here, there's a pre-marked ring. There's a total of 10 pre-marked rings and they're based on whatever the close focal, most close focal value is for each lens. And also they have different spreads. You know, sometimes if you know you work between whatever, 10 and 20 feet, you pick the ring that is the most accurate for, your, for that specific spread. Um, there are now also rings available for lefties where you can flip this around. When you put it on, the screen actually flips. And now it's also for people that are left-handed. And also there's now rings that are reversed where the scale is printed reversed. So if somebody wants to pull infinity like this, you can also have a ring for somebody that pulls infinity like this. And there's people that do it differently somehow for whatever reason. Um, so this was the battery. There is an, it's, an, it's a Sony battery, but it's labeled Airy because there's a certain chip in here um, that actually gives you more precise um, percentage readout here versus only having one, two, three bars. And then you kind of see, OK, three bars, two bars, one bar. Right now, it actually tells me I have 86% battery. Right? So that's the main difference. But you can also use a generic battery. It's probably less expensive, but uh, yeah. There's a NATO rail on top. And I didn't bring my little monitor adapter bracket that slides right on here. Uh, then you could attach a little viewfinder, a little monitor to this. We have um, on the back here, we have two ports. One is a serial port. One is an Elbus port. Um, the serial port, it's a little unknown right now what that does, but there is, um, there's like a Russian arm with the flight head that in theory should be able to get information from here to control zoom on, on, on that system. I don't know if that really works as of today. Um, the Elbus, uh, you can hardwire this to a camera. This is when you want to do underwater stuff, for example, and you're above water and you want to kind of control a camera that's in a housing. Um, you can also upgrade um, like motors or master grips, anything that you attach to here. If you wanted to upgrade it from this hand unit, you can do so. Um, so there is a USB-C slot on the top uh, where you can um, save uh, files from, you can also do upgrades from. And then on the bottom, there is a USB-C3 slot, but this is not a USB stick. This is a dongle, a Bluetooth dongle that lets you connect with your phone um, to an app and you can manage your lens data. Because lots of these lenses here, they're not smart lenses. That means they, they have no contacts on the back. I mean, this one, this one has contacts, but um, the Ultra Primes don't, and the older ones also don't have that. Versus the Signature Primes has these LDS-2 contacts. Uh, these are slash I contacts that, um, that are on this su um, Supreme Prime here. And usually rental houses, they create these lens tables for you where every lens is somewhere, and you can basically use this app to just load this into a camera. And if you're using air motors, then the lens data is also recorded um, if you have a need for that one. There are additional licenses that come with this Hi5 to control, for example, a Sony camera, or to control a RED camera, or um, there's a license from CineRT that um, also lets you integrate their uh, focus bug. There's a little uh, ultrasonic little, um, it's a small little square that you can put in your pocket. And it can track up to two, two of these devices, basically, with this unit. Um, and also, their distance measure device lets you actually set markers that feed into the system here. Right? So that's another 
um, option to, yeah, to control things differently. Um, there is also a Cinefate license. Cinefate is a company that um, out of Austria, and they make a little. It's a variable ND that can be controlled, um, where you you basically can maintain aperture. So so the brightness stays the same, but the depth of field changes from infinity to very shallow, right? So you have this effect where, let's say, a person is really in close-up and the whole world kind of uh, falls onto, his, onto him and then you have this, this effect and that's the cinephate that can also be controlled. So one of the biggest things that is new here is basically this removable modem, right? So this is the white modem. All the ARRI cameras have a white modem. Right, there were different generations, so this is also backwards con compatible to an Alexa XT, to an Alexa Mini, um, anything that had these modems. And you see there's three of them. So there's three different modems. One is um, uh, EMIP2400. So this is the one that um, kind of ships with every, every camera. Then there's a orange one, uh, which is a Frequency hopping, this is only point to point, so that means I couldn't break out different radios to separate them, separate them. It's only point to point. And then there's one with the long antenna, which I don't have here, that's the 900 megahertz one, which is only um, available for the US and Canada, and that has the longest range. The secret is that pretty much nobody uses 900 megahertz anymore. This used to be your old home telephone, right? Uh, but we did tests with this um, in New York, in Manhattan, and we did, I think, 13, 14 blocks. We still had connection with the 900 megahertz radio, right? So that's, that's kind of um, the advantage why you want to have different radios. So obviously these radios work with the radio interface adapter, which is this device, right? Because if you have orange ones, I don't only replace the radio here, I will also have to have a receiver that lives on a camera to receive this specific orange radio, right? If, if you're, because um, if I have the, so um, again, and this, is, this is also a new device. This is kind of like a motor controller, but also with removable antenna. It's kind of like our old um, Seaforce RF motor, but at that point, the white antenna was built in. You couldn't change it. So this also will work with the new um, ZMU4. Um, so it's the same radius, kind of. And think about, you can do different things with these things. You can, you can have a myriad of different configurations to um, help you kind of uh, solve um, problems or split things apart. Uh, this chart um, shows you a little bit the differences between the, fr the different radios. I mean, you see the 900 one has a high power mode that can also transmit at one watt. Uh, the other ones are basically only 100 milliwatts or about 70.8 milliwatts. Also, the 900 one has about 100 predefined channels, um, as well as the orange one and versus the white one has only 14 fixed channels. Right, so that there's a little limitation there how many things you can use at the same time. So the ZMU4 is primarily, as you can see here, a wireless device. But you can also take the radio off, and then it's just like a microforce. You can plug it in, directly connect it to the motor, and you can have it on a hand grip. And, and it doesn't need to be wireless, right? But the advantage is that. I could take the ZMU4, connect it to a motor, and connect it to a Sony or a RED camera or any other camera without having to, to add another motor controller. Because it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of, it's this inside of the ZMU4, right, if you think about it. But it obviously only has a zoom knob, right, so it doesn't make sense to use it, use it, use it for anything else. We have, um, adjustable 
curves, right, this uh, zoom button lets you uh, select logarithmic um, linear curves, basically that means how the zoom starts, right, from the point you hit the zoom button. Is it going to ramp up? Is it going to be flat? Is it going to be linear? You can all set the stuff um, separately. It recalibrates the joystick after each reboot. Um, what else is there? The battery lasts um, super long, like 14 hours. There's a cam port and an Elbus port on it. So cam always goes to the camera. And that's true also for this device here. Um, and we have uh, three user buttons on the back side. Um, are there three? Yes, and two dedicated buttons to change the speed. The front is, uh, there's a small LCD screen. There's a record button, there's a power button, and you can set limits or you can set um, zoom marks that, that um, and this is it. Oh, and it comes also with a, a couple of brackets. These brackets can help you mount it either to a pan handle or in this case it's mounted to an OCU, Operator Control Unit, on the left where you can control iris and you can see it's attached to a pan handle on a camera. So you can have both controls. And this would be hardwired if you're hardwiring it. And again, there's lots of different configuration ways for whatever camera you have. There's typically always a barcode on these things. I don't know if there is one on here where you can, when you scan it, you can get to the website and it gives you different configurations. So the OCU1, this is this little thing here. Most people, I don't know, do you guys have the OCU1 here? Yes. Yeah, so most people are not aware of what that is and why it's here. Because right now you see I have no control because my control is actually here. So the AC has this with him. So let's say he goes to the bathroom break and the director wants to kind of grab the camera and frame a shot, he can't do it because the motor engages. So now there's an override button. So in this case, if I hit it, now I actually have control of, of this axis and, and this turns red. So he knows actually he has no control right now, right? Because I have control here. And I can also pass it back to him. So now I have no control here. And this turns green. And he can pretty much turn until this engages again. Right? So this is kind of what this was intended originally. Right? And you can toggle through the axis. If I have three motors, I can control each axis individually at, the, at, at one time. So the radio interface adapter, the RIA-1, this is um, pretty much the idea was to, to make interchangeable radios. But this also, um, there's also a barcode here. This can also be an in the, um, um, configured as a client, um, meaning I can combine these two things and be on a monitor, just adjusting the iris, right? Or I can have this control focus on a single axis, right? So it's, it can work in many, many different ways. Or it can have a master grip connected with this thing. Now I have a wireless master grip, whether it's a zoom rocker or a focus control or, or iris control. So this is what master grips look like. They're usually more like owner operator things because they're people um, that shoot all by themselves. They like to have the controls at their fingertips. Um, but again, you could also make it wireless by combining it with, with this. So there's a new firmware out um, for the motors, we'll, which will make these motors more, more responsive. It just came out last week. I have not updated my motors yet, but I can do it later. So to show you the difference, it's, it's, um, now the motor is almost twice as responsive as before. Um, and again, it, it, it because right now, when I, when I do it right now, there is a little lag where I kind of feel, um, okay, so there is always more data that we're sending. When we're, when we're transmitting data, we're sending a lot of lens data and then also confirming what's there, right? So, and, and there's always a little trace here. 
that uh, will show you that the motor hasn't arrived at that specific point, right, that, that you will be able to see. Also, I didn't mention on this device, you see that yellow bar, how it changes? Well, that's your depth of field indicator, right? And based on whatever iris you have, you can, it can show you your depth of field is either more or less. So that covers the electronic accessory sides. Um, any questions so far? No questions, then we'll move on to the lenses. So there's lots of lenses out there, and there's even more that came in the last five years or so. I mean, there's a myriad of lenses out there. But most people are not aware that Aerie has actually made more lenses than anybody else. So if I count all the lenses we made from back from the standard speeds to the super speeds, the ultra primes, master primes, master anamorphics, uh, Allura zooms, there's probably over 60 some lenses that we made. And um, this business of lenses is a little bit misunderstood. Most people don't put airy and lenses together because we always, always put also the lens manufacturer name on these, on these lenses, right? So the ultra prime will say Zeiss and airy, but it was commissioned by us. It was designed by us. It was uh, basically developed in conjunction with the company that makes lenses. And Zeiss was very conveniently lo located in Germany. So over the years, we worked more with them, but um, we also worked with other companies you know, over the years. And um, what we are always, uh, our philosophy about lenses is a little bit different than maybe what you see right now. There is right now a little bit of a ten tendency to counter a digital camera with softer, called vintage lenses, right? And uh, that's why there's this explosion of older glass that is rehoused because it has a certain look or a certain feel or it looks softer and, and, and um, again, it's great to have more choices, right? But there's also a lot of confusion. What, what are we looking for in a lens? At least us from, from our end, we're trying to develop next generation lenses and um, while there was always a, an upgrade, right, from the ultra primes to the master primes to the master anamorphics, all these lenses had a, a reason why they came out. And um, the, the next step was actually the signature primes that came out first, just about when the Alexa LF came out. Um, these were, for the first time, they were large format lenses, but they can also work in Super 35. And there's a total of 16 of these. So 16 lenses from 12 mil all the way to 280. They're made out of magnesium, super lightweight. And um, we, when we look at a lens, or when we look at a lens, what we want it to be, we want it to be a lens that is used for faces, because most of the time people want to look good. And um, it has low contrast, but it wants to reproduce the skin tones that are out there. Uh, we don't want it to breathe, right? When you do focus racking, we don't want um, any distortion. We don't want any chromatic aberrations. There's many, many things to kind of uh, make a lens good. And that's also what makes a lens expensive. So a lens like this is probably 25,000 bucks. And it probably has more elements, more optical elements than any of these old lenses that are considered still lenses, right? It's considered still lens design that has maybe three, four, five elements in there versus this has maybe seven to 12 elements in there that are there for a reason. And um, yeah, so I'll show you. So this is, so this is uh, they're basically 1.8, almost through except for the 200, which is a 2.5, and a 280 is 2.8. The reason for that is it would have been much, much bigger physically. And um, the zooms, there's four zooms, uh, 16 to 32, 24 to 75, 45 to 135, and 65 to 300. I have the 24 to 75 here. They are a little bit slower. They are uh, one point, uh, 2.8. And again, they have a very um, natural look, 
there's nothing that, that really um, looks artificial about them. The way they fall out of focus looks very smooth in both direction, meaning in front of your focus plane and behind your focus plane. When you're thinking about the anamorphic, uh, sorry, the anamorphic, the widest, one of the widest one is the 15 here, this shot. It is very rare, and here's a 12. It's very, very hard to create shallow depth of field with a wide angle lens. And most of the time, everything is pretty much sharp from wherever you're looking. With the signature wide angle 15, you actually have a nice fall off, um, even with the wide angle uh, zoom. So it gives you a, a very unique look. Um, my colleague Art did this um, lens comparison by shooting um, a face with different generation lenses. And you see A, B, C, D, E. The fourth one is actually the signature prime. Um, and you can see distinctive difference, maybe not from where you are, but you'll see probably the, the most contrast is probably the left one, the soft ones, one is probably this one. From micro contrast, they look probably the same, right? So it's, but there is also a difference. The right one looks a little bit brighter, right? And the skin looks a bit more natural, like it was, compared to the other one, it's warmer. Um, and then we noticed also in some of these lenses that are rehoused or based on still lens design, they're not corrected for when you're to maintain the T-stop, when you're close focus to infinity, for example, right? And there's a little change happening. And if you're looking at this change, something that's six feet close might be darker than when you're at infinity, right? And that is, has to do with the breathing. Some lenses breathe and then they also change slightly the exposing, the, the, they look slightly darker. So with the signature, this is perfectly corrected. You don't have any brighter or darker uh, ramping. The flares are also very much corrected or controlled, I should say. And again, you see this shot here. It is, um, it is shot directly into the sun and it doesn't really lift your blacks. Usually when you have, we have a few vintage lenses here also that they have a coating where the flare is intentional, right? Which you may want it for a story for a specific reason. Uh, but you see here, it doesn't really make her look gray, right? Because it's controlling, it's very much controlled flare. Um, there's also like, you see, it's a very nice, beautiful glow like a veiling glare. Um, and um, yeah, there, um, I lost my thought here. Um, so this is now going back to the um, close up. Also, they have a very, um, you can go very close with these lenses. Um, in this case, we have the 15 millimeter lens and we are one inch from the element, from the front of the lens element. And you can see very little distortion, right? So they're very well corrected. Um, there are, everybody knows Duclos. Duclos makes this little, uh, it's called an expansion tube. It's one, it's 15 millimeters. And it basically brings the lens a little bit further away from the back. And it will turn every prime or every zoom into something like a macro. So if you're out of a macro, you can put this on, you can go as close as you want in front of a lens and it's like a fake macro if you want to call it that because the, the marks don't line up but you could get away by uh, blowing something up that's super, super fine, right? And with this thing and we can try it later on, on that camera over there. Uh, here's another shot of the surfer here with the 15 mil wider ang wide angle lens. And you see she'll walk away into this soft, very soft out of focus image. So, so Shelly Johnson, he's um, ASC um, DP. He did a master class with the signatures and he loved them. He said it's like a journey into the black where there's much more shadow detail than before. So even if you have 
light that, that kind of shines at you. It doesn't really erase the blacks. You have solid blacks um, and more shadows. And also looking forward to HDR and 8, uh, 8K displays. Uh, actors are always worried about how are they going to look on these displays, right? So you want a lens that doesn't have high micro contrast because you don't want to see every pore. You don't want something, uh, you want a face to be pleasing, not distorting, especially when you see it on a big screen. Um, and these lenses are going forward, they are lenses where you can modify these looks and I'll get into this with the, um, with these new filters that we just came out with. Um, you guys are probably aware of focus breathing. Focus breathing happens with still lenses. Again, they're designed for taking a still at one focal range and another one, nobody cares that they breathe. But here's an example of Signature Prime 75, how it guides you where you look without you noticing that we're guiding you. And there's no distraction. There's no zooming happening. There's no, um, it is just, I mean, this is kind of what's the difference between an expensive lens and a cheap lens. Here's another example. So this is a competitive lens. You see, we're changing focus from the little chessboard to the background. And the whole thing gets smaller and bigger, right? And now you have the signature prime. And you see that's what makes out no breathing. So um, we changed the mount here. So the mount is bigger. It's called LPL mount. And also you'll notice the lens element is very big. Uh, the reason for this is you can, um, when the flange focal distance is closer to the camera, you can design lenses differently. And this, um, LPL mount is 44 millimeter versus the PL mount, which um, you can add. If you wanted to have a old PL lens, you can add this adapter. It brings it back out to 52 millimeter, so you can work in both worlds. But the reason for this, and these are by design what's called near telecentric. That means the exit pupil is almost in the front here, so light rays are coming out almost straight. So this is a traditional older generation lens where you see the exit pupil is smaller typically, right? So when you hit, the, this is a photo side, this is a pixel if you want to call it, right? And the bigger your pixel is, um, what's around a pixel is usually 50% is not photosensitive. So if you're looking at a it is sensor, right? So 50% um, of that is just not doing anything. It's like just um, called a fill factor. So you want to bundle these lights to that photosensitive, photosensitive area. And we're using micro lenses. So each pixel has a micro lens that wants to bundle that light to it. And if, you're, if light exits in this steer, uh, steep angle, you get darker outsides than inside. And the correction here with this lens is actually that light exits almost straight. So you hit, you have no darker outside corners. So that's one of those things. It's also like um, when you guys are here afterwards, you can look through, through this lens. And um, when you look through it, you will, it, it appears that the iris is in front of this lens, even though physically it's here. That's kind of, it's an optical effect that you get by looking through this. So, um, yeah, so here's the example, the exit pupil where it is physically. Um, I didn't mention this, there is, every signature prime has a magnetic net holder. So these net holders, uh, there's different material you can buy, right? Um, I mean, I cut these already um, and just um, use a rubber band, cover it, cut it out, and now you can put this on any lens, boom and you have a different effect in your bokeh, right? Or you can cut out certain shapes if you wanted certain shapes. So this is kind of something also, it's much easier than to figure out how to glue something to the back, right? Gluing this net to the back for it to hold, this is the way to go. 
Um, again, this is only with the signature primes or signature zooms. Um, you can also use fishing line. Like fishing line sometimes is used to simulate this anamorphic streak, right, in this picture here. Um, you can see that it's like, again, you can, magnet, uh, you can position this in 12 positions because the magnets are kind of holding it in space. With the, and if you have it vertical, the streak will be horizontal. If you have it diagonal, it would be always the opposite, right, 90 degrees. So that's about the net holder. Um, large format and super 35, there's always a confusion between um, what does it mean. It just means you have a bigger sensor. So if you see the inside is super 35, the outside would be um, mini LF, large format. So if you're shooting with um, the same lens on two different cameras, you will see more area around your subject. If you would want it to match this with the mini LF, you would have to use a longer lens, right? Or you have to go closer to the subject, right? To get the same head size. And then also that changes your depth of field. Um, and you get shallow depth of field on your left than you have on your right. So this brings me to these impression filters. And I wish I would have brought this little case with me because it's pretty cool. It's an aluminum case where all these filters are in there but I, it's always an extra carry-on. So, uh, and you'll see in this case we have a little tool. This is a little um, adjustable Torx uh, screwdriver that lets you remove the mount uh, for shimming, okay? So, the idea for these um, impression filters is basically because people are using vintage glass. We said, well, can we make a modern lens also look like vintage? Like not, not imitate a lens, but can you get something? And, and we figured out because the way they're built, it's actually, that's the wrong one. Um, it is possible, right? So we came up with these, um, they're, they're diopters. There's four negative diopters and um, there's four positive diopters. The positive diopters, you do not need to shim the lens because the only thing that changes is your close focal mark will be shifting. But the negative diopters, you will have to use a shim. And there's some shims that this comes with. There's two types of shims here, a two millimeter and a 1.85 millimeter. They're, they're, they're very thick. Where did I put this one? I'll put this on here. So, um, so you see it's also magnetic. It pops right on here. Um, and again, these are solid shims um, that if you use the negative one, you have to unscrew these, um, put the shim in there, and then it can work either with the, with the, with the primes, 1.8, it's a two millimeter shim, or the 185 for the zooms at 2.8. And this effect, uh, I'll get to that in a second, so, um, so this is the naming. So there's a naming. This, uh, we're, we're calling this one IV70P. So impression vintage 70P stands for positive, obviously. N stands for negative. And there's four strengths for the positive ones and four strengths for the negative ones. And it also gives you the, a s different effect, right? less from least to the most. Um, the positive one have what we call the glamorous filter. They, they soften the focus plane, but they also add like a glow to the skin tone. The negative ones, they, we call them the gritty filter. They make uh, things look more harsher. They don't add this glow effect to it. Um, there is an optical change, obviously. It's a diopter physically. So from the most strongest positive to the most uh, strongest negative one, the, it can be 8% of an image, either magnification or reduction. Um, this is shimming when you're shooting at different T-stops. Again, 
the effect goes away the more you close the lens. So I don't think you would get much past the 2.8, right? I mean, you will get some effects, but like with any vintage lens, the effect that is like most visible is wide open, always. So here's an example of a picture. Um, this is without any filter. This is a signature prime. Again, by themselves, they have a very beautiful character. character. Um, now, when we're adding the positive one, you'll see that she looks more softer. Her face looks softer. She, her skin glows more. And again, this is the strongest example. It also does stuff to the background and foreground, but we don't see much of that here. This would be the negative one. And again, you saw the size change. Also, she is bigger with the negative one. She's smaller with the positive one. But she doesn't have the glow here. It looks a little bit um, harder, I would say. And these are the, both ex extreme examples, the positive one and the negative one. Here's another example in full sun where we have the positive one side by side. And you can see the scale, so how it gets stronger and stronger, and basically also softer and softer, or more glow to the right. And this is the negative one. It also gets softer, but it doesn't have that same glowing skin. Now, this was about what's in focus, what happens. Now, also, I want to talk about what happens for the out of focus area. And this can be in front or behind, right? And we, we call um, bokeh happens everywhere. It doesn't only happen when there's a light spot. It happens at anything that you're looking that's out of focus. And uh, it's more visible when you have a light spot, because then it's defined right, as a circle or oval or whatever it is. And there is typically, with whatever lens you want to put on, there will be differences. Some of them will have donut bokeh. Donut means you have a hot outside, hot ring. And some of them will be having a halo, which is a hot spot inside or on the side. And this can be either donut behind your focus plane or donut in front of your focus plane. And it changes. So here is, on the left, um, no filter. And this is, again, we're looking at the background of a, a, a picture that's out of focus. And on the right side, we have the positive one. You see it's kind of smearing more together. It looks more dreamy-like versus uh, the left one. And if we're going to the negative one, it gets more contrasty. It is more dominating, more and more in your face versus the soft one. And this also can apply to Here's a picture that shows um, foreground, background, and focus plane. So she's now in the focus plane. He's in front of that focus plane. And the lights in the background are behind. And when we use this positive one, there's also what you see. You see a little swirly effect, like the whole image kind of turns like a swirl. That swirl effect is only there with the positive one. It's not there with the negative one. This now is the negative one. And you see the background becomes more dominant. The foreground, he, he is now softer. You notice he got softer. If I go back, see he's, sh he's sharper. And now here he is softer in the foreground. And that's because um, the bokeh actually changes, right? So if you're looking in, at the top, the background has the halo, and the foreground is the donut uh, bouquet, and with the negative one, the, back, the background is donut and foreground is halo. Right? So and this is kind of happening um, at anything that you're looking at. So it's also a little bit harder to focus now. When you're working with these, you have to pay attention not to, um, um, to sharpness, but you have to focused by contrast. <clears throat> so um, this is a chart where we're looking only at these bottom big bars, um, the 20 um, line bars. And you'll see here, this is the, the weakest positive filter. On the left, it is focused by contrast. On the right side, it's focused by sharpness. Right, so You're looking at the sharpness of the line. 
and the lines, um, the marks of a lens will mark, will line up if you're focusing by contrast, right? So there's, again, I'm gonna go stronger, 140p, and then it gets stronger to the 230p, and then this is the strongest one at 330p. And again, you'll see uh, that edge is much sharper here, but this feels, sh by contrast, sharper. Right, so that's something that uh, you have to kind of um, keep in mind. Again, here's an example out of a real world where there's no light bulbs around us, and also this is nothing, and now you have the positive one. And also you, you see how it's kind of, it melts more in the background, and they almost, they stick out more, it looks more three-dimensional. Um, so, there are some examples on our website. When you go to our website, there's this little slider with four pictures, and you can go and you can kind of see at least the most extreme filter, what it does. You know, and it kind of gives an idea of what, what, how this works. Now, you notice this sticks out quite a bit, so when you pull it out of the camera, sometimes when you pull the lens out and you do this, it, it can get caught, so, so make sure you hold your hand underneath there when you pull the lens off. Right, I mean, because it's only a magnet. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. Uh, Tiffin um, also started to make behind the lens filters, some of their effect filters. Um, they look very similar to this. Um, that you can now, if you decide you work with a specific Tiffin filter, night fog, they have different, different versions. You can basically make sure you shim the lens to whatever their specification is and then you can have this on the back of your uh, signature prime as well. So this brings me to the end of the lens story, and there is a new video that my colleague Art shot in New York. I'm gonna play this now. I hope it's gonna play back here. So this was shot just with the zooms. Zoom reel. Let's see if you will hear it. Uh, Okay. Oh, it's not there. I guess I have to cancel this. So this is on the website. Uh, why is this not letting me out? Okay, there it was for a second. Mm. Sorry. Yeah, so here it is. Let me see if this plays. I'm Art Adams, graphic oh. specialist for cinema lenses at Area Americas. This is a short tour of New York City as seen through our most extreme signature zooms. The 16 to 32, Can you hear? the 65 to 300. My assistant and I used only an Alexa 35 camera, a short slider, and some Apple boxes to capture these images. I hope you enjoy the show. I don't normally zoom in my work as a cinematographer, but I realized that if I didn't, you might not believe that I was using zooms. I probably wouldn't. So that's the reason why this video will feel like a short visit to the 1970s. The 65-300 to 300 zoom really shows its stuff when zooming into a face. It's a great close-up lens. Signature lenses, both primes and zooms, excel at rendering skin beautifully. And I'm not joking when I say that they intercut perfectly. Signature zooms look great edge to edge, and they stay that way all through the zoom range. But if you'd like to soften the edges, you can add an impression filter. This shot was captured through a positive impression filter. The look is a little softer at the point of focus, and I can see a smearing effect in the leaves and fencing at the edges of the frame. The native signature look is quite beautiful, so it's also okay to shoot through nothing at all. The 16 to 32 zoom is special, but it's not necessarily a specialty lens. 
I'm happy to use it for both wide shots and close-ups, and there's no reason I wouldn't use it for an entire scene. It flares beautifully, much like a prime lens would, and the flare is isolated to one area, so it doesn't wash out the entire frame. The 16-32 is incredibly rectilinear. Lines at the edge of the frame don't bend, and faces don't distort. For such a wide lens, it looks extremely natural. It's rare that super wide and super long zooms intercut perfectly, but that's exactly what I see here. Signatures are great at focusing your attention on a single subject. They roll out of focus so smoothly, but it's always obvious where your eye should go. Unlike a lot of other zooms, signatures capture detail that's not too sharp and not too soft. It just feels natural. These lenses don't draw attention to themselves. This is especially obvious when you reach the end of the zoom and the exposure doesn't change at all. Sometimes I find myself wowed by simple shots like this. The textures in the image come through very naturally and don't feel artificially sharp at all. It's funny, but I had to remind myself that I could, in fact, zoom, because I kept forgetting that I was using zooms. The way they roll out of focus, the way they flare, the way they don't breathe, there was nothing visually obvious to remind me that I was using zooms. And if I'm working at the end of the zoom at sunset, I don't lose any exposure between wide shots and tight shots. That's gold. Using these two zooms together was a lot of fun because they look so similar. Here's the 65 to 300. And this is the 16 to 32 zoom. And back to the 65 to 300 zoom again. They intercut perfectly. The nice thing about shooting in New York is that you can go almost anywhere and no one cares. We took our Alexa 35 to Times Square and grabbed a 360 degree shot with the 16 to 32 zoom, lit entirely by digital billboards. The results are pretty cool. you enjoyed my 1970s style tour of New York. If I can ever help with anything related to Airy lenses, please contact me at lenses at airy.com. And thanks for watching. So that was Art's little clip from New York. Let's go back here. Any questions about lenses? Yes. I have a couple questions about the impression filters. Yes. So the slide said when using the positive ones, focal, the marks stay the same. Yes. It did not say that on the negatives. They will not stay the same. What, ch what changes? They completely you? shift. Can the high five correct it? No, because um, again, you will not reach infinity with the negatives, which is one of the issues why you have to add a shim to reach infinity. So my, right. my second question is, after you've shimmed to either the positive or the negative, you can go through each of the series of the P's or the M's without having to reshim. Right, and again, the positive ones, you don't need to shim. Right. The negative ones are the only ones that you shim. And I think, I mean, from just, I like the positive effect better. It has this glamour Hollywood look, so, but again, people will, for different reasons, they might, may use different things. So it is a little tricky when you have, uh, depends how many lenses you have in your kit, because there's only three shims, three of the two millimeter shims and three of the 1.85 millimeter shims in this little kit here. So technically you can only trim sh three lenses, 
um, at a time, but this is also available to, to be purchased separately where somebody wants to, let's say they take six lenses out on a job and they know they're going to use them all. You would then have to shim all these lenses ahead of time and then you, you have no problems using the shims, the, the negative ones. So um, if there's no more questions, we're going to move on to the camera side because I know this is probably why you guys are here in the first place. Uh, let me see if this plays again. Yes. So, um, so there are a bunch of cameras here. It's hard to see from where you are, but um, the Alexa 65 was actually the first camera where we, we tried to make a large, large sensor, uh, basically 65 millimeter sensor. And that was the predecessor to the Alexa LF, the mini LF. Um, and then last year the Alexa 35 came out and the difference is not only a few more pixels on the sensor it's a whole new sensor design right so there's this is a picture of the sensor itself it's super 35 it's not large format <coughs> but for I thought I turned this off I guess my watch I don't know how to sound it's my watch because my phone is silent so um, but this is a new sensor um, that can see more, is more sensitive, has more dynamic range, has less noise, uh, has a bigger ISO range uh, than what we had before. So we're now at 17 stops of dynamic range versus before, all our sensors before had about 14 and a half stops. Um, you may want to ask yourself why do you need more dynamic range or when? Do you need more dy dynamic range? Uh, is it really important to, mm, to have those 17 stops? And again, I don't know, I ask you guys. Anybody needs 17 I'll stops? Say, uh, we shot this, this guy on the front row. <coughs> yeah. Uh, what, two weeks ago? Yeah. And, um, and basically, the background was pulling out. We shot a good bit of it. And uh, we were able to bring that down. To bring it all back. Yeah. You're, you're at 100, you have no, nothing, but it was staying just about 10% below that, at 90%. That's a good example. I mean, that's a good example. Not everybody shoots against windows, but that's kind of when you kind of get away with a lot of brightness in the background, and you can still recover the image. You know, and this is, again, for run and gun situation, it's very helpful. Um, but it's also like, Bright lights in the dark nights. In this case, this is uh, shot with a underwater DSLR camera. I forgot which camera this was, but um, and the diver has a emergency flashlight that is a red light. But you'll see here it actually is clipping, turning orange and purple. When you're looking what the camera sees, the camera sees actually a red light, and this is graded for the highlights. There's no clipping anywhere in the light. This is here graded for the shadows. You see his face that's there. This is log C, what the camera actually records. And false color, when you overlay the false color, there's no clipping in this image whatsoever. So in many situations, there are small little light spots that may be any color whatsoever, not only a window. It could be blue, red, green, whatever bright spot that's there that you have no problem seeing, but a digital camera or a camera will, it will clip cameras. And at that point, 17 stops has no problems um, maintaining that. <clears throat> Obviously, the same applies for shadows and going into the blacks, um, because we also noticed that the, the lens mounts that we had before, up to that point, they were not optimized for stray light correction. Right, and sometimes, depending what lens you have, um, some lenses, they project an image that is much, much wider than the sensor and that light refracts back and you're lifting your blacks. So we redesigned all these lens mounts to have a built-in stray light correction. 
So there is also a new PL mount now with LBUS, one with Hiroshi. Um, and it allows you, especially when you have an OLED display at your house, and you, nice, and, and you can see much deeper into the blacks. So we're, we kind of added one stop of dynamic range into the blacks and about one and a half stops uh, dynamic range to the highlights. We have um, in the camera, we have a mode that's called uh, enhanced sensitivity mode. This um, basically lets you denoise an image. If you're shooting high ISO levels at dark scenes, you can have the camera denoise versus doing a denoising in post, which you can also do in post, but it's in the camera, it's a slightly different process. The camera will record a second image, compare these two images, identify the noise, then throw the other image away. So, um, which you couldn't do in post, so it's a different denoising. Um, also, it has a limitation that basically when you're doing this, you are limiting yourself to half the maximum frame rates. So if the camera shoots 100 frames, in, in that mode you can only shoot fix 50 frames because you're always recording the second image, right? And you cannot shoot more than 180 degree shutter. So that's a new function. Again, I don't know if people are going to use it. Um, it depends really on, on your personal taste. Um, so here is an example of what that looks like. Okay, on the left we have 6400 um, ISO. In the middle we have 6400 ES. And on the right, we combined it with a texture. And I don't know if you can see from there. Um, it's hard to see from where you guys are. There's less color in the noise because the, the noise, the, the shadow texture desaturates the color in the noise. But right? it looks more normal, more organic, not so much like digital noise that shows up always randomly as red, green, or blue pixels. Here's an example. This was shot at that beach, just lit by the fire, and at 6400 ES, and it looks, looks good. So um, obviously, we didn't only change the sensor. We also looked at everything else. So we looked at the, the workflow. Um, we looked at um, the look files, um, the whole image processing chain from the um, not only hardware, because the hardware is basically a new sensor. We have texture. We have also like um, every color matching, meaning that if you have two cameras, they are matched now when you're on set with two, three, four cameras, they will match perfectly, which was a little bit tricky before. So every camera has its own, we call it a unit calibration, and that helps you be um, yeah, having the same, the same image. Before you were sometimes 200 degrees, 300 degrees off that you could then just dial in with the white balance. Uh, in this case, you don't have that anymore. So we also announced what we call reveal color signs. The reveal color signs is basically a new overhaul of the image processing, right? So. Um, a lot of this info is also on white papers online that you can see, but it's, it's a new debayer algorithm. It's uh, basically rewriting the codes new. There's a new um, white gamut color space where you have more colors, more finer colors. Um, there's a new log, log C4. Um, and also there's a new transform to a display color space. So if you toggle between log back and forth, which many DPs do when they have a situation like what you explained before, you will notice that log C4 is darker. And that's just because the, the lot, I mean the, the curve that you see here is not as steep and your 18% gray will be lower, right? 18% will be at uh, 28 IRE versus it used to be at 39 before. So, but that's not, nothing to worry about. It's just a fact. That's how it is. So you see on the left, you have log C3. On the right, you have log C4. When you convert it back to a, to a uh, display space, the brightness is back to where it's supposed to be. 
and also you, you notice there's less green um, with the new color because we had a little bit green tint in the old color signs. So um, it's important to know that the old look files from the Alexa Mini, Mini LF, they will not work. Uh, so that's a little uh, concerning, especially to post house or people that work in grading because they, they have libraries of hundreds and hundreds of uh, lots that they used on shows. Um, I'll get into the details um, in a second why that is the case. So you'll have to download a specific monitor LUT online. There's some, of, some online for HDR, for SDR. Um, they're on our website and they're also built in many of these applications uh, as of now. Um, initially when this camera started shipping, many people had only one camera and then they had other cameras and the question came up, can you mix and match these two? And it was only possible with the Mini LF because the MXF wrapper was similar, but it was not possible with the Alexa Mini or other cameras. It is now possible with the new ARI reference tool to apply the revealed color signs to footage captured with older cameras, as long as you're recording RAW. And again, if you're recording RAW, you can go into your computer and then you can apply um, basically the new color signs and the colors will match. Obviously, they will not match on set, right? So, because you, on set, the camera processes it with the old log C3 and your monitor out will just connect to something there. But if you're recording no, uh, RAW, you will know that in post, they will match. Um, there's some examples here of what that difference is and also Art shot this by trying extreme colors, extreme um, examples to see what happens. And this was shot only with the Mini LF, but one is applies the original color, Loxy 3, and the other one applies the reveal color signs. And you'll see it basically on the sign and again, the circles kind of, you see better what the color difference is when the circle floats around here. And this is also not only the clipping, right, but it's also the color signs that's different. And it's hard to describe what is this just more realistic versus um, the older color signs was more like, okay, I can tell what the sky panel color was that, was that it was lit with. And now it's more the color of the object. So um, there is um, also, for the first time, we, we opened the door to textures. We always had a texture in our camera, but it was only one specific baked in texture. You had no say in it whatsoever. I mean, it's part of the reason why our images always look better. Um, now, after so many years of the existing sensor, people were always like, can you give us more? Where we have choices, where we can make something totally different. And this is when textures came in. And the camera ships with maybe eight textures. Um, and there's now four more you can download. And there will be more made in the future, basically based on the requests that we get from you guys. So if somebody has a feature coming up and they wanted to create their own specific texture, um, you can basically send us an email, not me, but the guys in Munich. And then in a few days, they can create something for you. It's a very complicated process that requires like 30 some steps. And important to know, textures are burned in. Look files are not burned in, but textures are always burned in. So you have to always check, shoot tests based on your lighting, based on your scene, and then watch the stuff on a big monitor, 4K monitor, to see is this really what you want? Because you cannot take it away. And um, also what defines a texture? 
uh, if you look at the naming convention, every texture starts with a letter. The letter stands for the type of grain. Then the first number is how much grain you have, right? Nine would be the most, zero would be the least. The next number is how much contrast of fine detail you have, and then how much contrast of coarse detail you have. Then we add a name so you know roughly what it's for. And that's kind of how we had come up with a logical way where you can think about what these things do. And again, these textures are initially very subtle, so it's hard to see sometimes, especially when you're far away. But you'll see here underneath her eyebrow, you know, there's less contrast on the right side than on the left side. So, and here there is more contrast on the right side. You'll see it here better. And again, you wouldn't want to use high clarity for a face shot because you would, the face would look more harsher. You would see every pore. You don't want that, right? So, so this can also backfire. So you have to kind of know what to use these for if you decide to use them. This one is um, called Nostel. Yes, K445 is what's in the original Alexa. Again, if you don't want to play with textures, you can leave it alone. It's going to be what the other, what the other one was, right? And um, yeah, this nostalgic one has a lot of grain. You see number seven. Um, and I have it also in motion, but you, it's probably hard to see from where you are when I play it back. It looks very much like analog grain that kind of dances around. So look files. I mentioned before that the look files are now different. And you cannot use the old look files from the other cameras anymore. So in the old cameras, the, the actual LUT and the conversion to a display was one file. Right? You could only say, hey, I have a standard definition display. I'm using one LUT. If you had an HDR display, you needed another LUT. You couldn't use that at the same time. So now, with the Alexa 35, we split these two things up. So we have first a creative LUT, and then we're not doing a conversion to a color space. That is done in a second step. And the advantage is that you can have one output going to one monitor, a standard definition, and a second output going to an HDR monitor. And that lets you monitor HDR and SDR simultaneously side by side. If you would have two monitors side by side from the same camera, one could be an HDR monitor, the other one not. So that's also going forward. It makes it easier to, to know what you're lighting, to know what you're shooting for these both spaces. And that's why you couldn't use the older lots because you, already, you would apply that conversion to a monitor space twice. That make sense? So the look library is in also. So 87 looks that we know from the Alexa Mini. Now these are based on log C4. And the advantage is that we now can dial in percentages of a look file from 10 to 100% in 10% steps. So which is way more accurate and way more um, specific. In the old one, you had only three specific settings per lot, per lot. One was low, medium, and high. You know, now you have much, much finer adjustments which is more controls for you guys. Physically, the camera is almost as small as the Mini LF, or the Mini. You see here, it's maybe a little bit wider, a bit longer. It has a completely unique cooling structure where um, air is being uh, drawn in from the bottom. And then we have the electronics mounted around this, this cooling channel. This is very efficient cooling. We have the NDs built in. That's the same NDs the Alexa Mini has. We have an extra LBUS port on the camera. That means if somebody removes that LPUS L, that LPL mount, like Panavision, for example, you still have a, an LBUS port on the camera left to attach motors. The viewfinder is the same viewfinder we had on the Mini LF. The difference is that this monitor can also be showing you an HDR image now because of the new color signs. You can toggle back and forth between these th two things. 
Uh, this is a new monitor that we're coming out that should be shipping this week, I hope. Um, there will be a new firmware upgrade coming for this camera also this week, hopefully tomorrow. And then this new monitor is made by Small HD for us. And it has, it's a touch screen where you have full menu control on a seven screen, seven inch monitor. You have uh, user buttons on the side. You can navigate with the, with the little joystick. It has a beautiful little uh, hood that you can fold down and it's magnetic. Um, so this, the next time I'm here, I'll bring one of those. So um, we have on the camera side, we have this display means even if you don't use this viewfinder on a steady cam, you can control camera settings from this display. It has a um, screen saver mode that shows you what ND is engaged, because sometimes you don't know what ND is there. And we can add more stuff to the screen, depending what you guys are telling us. Yeah, this has the ability to switch between standard def and HDR. Um, media, there is um, media in here. Now, I forgot to show you this, because this has also a backlit um, light. Um, and I have, um, if I record, I have this now set to tally when I record. You see how it turned red? And no, it, and if this card is unplugged, it turns blue. So they're all little hints for the AC that, uh, that are useful. So there's two terabyte cards and one terabyte cards. Um, the two terabyte card is yellow, and, and you can obviously record every raw high speed. If you don't record every raw high speed, you will not need the two terabyte card. Again, drawers, you can record on the one terabyte card all the formats at high speed, you know, pretty much. And there's a total of um, 20 formats right now, 20 specific formats. We had only 19, and then we added another one um, that was requested. Um, important to know that some sensor formats have different recording resolutions. Right? So you see here, specifically in the 16 by 9 mode, there's four resolutions, 4K, Cine, UHD, 4K, 2K, and HD. So, so that's just something to remember. Um, what else? On the camera, the camera is a 24 volt camera. That means you need 24 volt batteries. It will not power up with a 12 volt battery, right? So you, there is a new uh, standard, it's called the B-mount, like Bravo, so it looks like this. Uh, Core makes batteries like these, which are great. Um, uh, the name B comes from Bebop, it's a company in Germany that um, started to develop this mount for us. And the advantage is it's a very solid mount, you can grab the camera from the battery and you can pan around, versus you couldn't do this with a gold mount or V-lock battery. There is um, an LED on the side of the camera that will show you if you have too, too, um, not enough power, because sometimes there's different AC-DC adapters that may not give you enough amperage, and then it's going to blink with these colors. This is a B-mount battery from Bebop. And again, there's different brands out there, SWIT and um, ID, IDE, or was it IDX? Yeah, this is battery consumption. And again, this is a power extension module which we have on this camera. This lets you add extra, extra monitors, fizzes, whatever you need to add. Um, there's seven ports. Um, Four 24 volt, uh, is it four, four, one, two, three, four, and two 12 volt ports, right. Now it says four amps, four amps, four amps, four amps, that's incorrect. It means four amps total for the 24 volt ones and two amps total for the 12 volts. So total is six amps you can get out of there. And then there's a D-tap on the bottom also. There's no D-tap anywhere. There's one on the bottom here. 
that you could use a regular DTAP if you wanted to. Um, so there is also an optional for run and gun documentary. There is an audio extension module. The camera has four channel, four channels you can record, but um, the input is a line level only input for two channels on the side of the camera, same port as the Alexa Mini LF has. Now, if you're adding this um, AEM1, audio extension module one, you can record two separate channels of either mic level, or you can feed phantom power out of there, or you can have digital audio going in there. It has little knobs, you can adjust uh, the, the, has a little small screen, you can adjust the levels. Um, and it's made by Zaxcom for us. Um, one question that's asked many times is, can you stack these two things? You cannot, because you would block the connectors by adding them on top of each other. So it's either one or the other. Um, we're almost done here. Wi-Fi, there's two little antennas on the back that um, let you connect with an app. And I can connect my phone if I find it. Um, um, and show you it's way more responsive than web browser, right? And you can customize your little layout. You can say, I want only these buttons and the rest I don't care for. And, and you can access the camera much, much, much faster than uh, previously. So um, there's two builds and I don't have the lightweight build here. The lightweight build is on the right side. I have only one component here of the top handle. Right, so this is kind of the camera with pretty much nothing else attached. Um, I didn't know what cameras you guys would have here. The left one is the production kit. It's basically what you see here and here, which has this uh, expansion, um, this um, viewfinder bracket that, that kind of works like a medium viewfinder bracket. This is an email to remember if you ever wanted to send requests for textures, custom textures, or if you get stuck with your workflow, you can send it to Munich. I mean, think about it. They're six hours ahead. Uh, maybe they're already sleeping by the time you're sending this stuff, but they will usually respond. Um, this chart shows you all our partner. Partners are basically programs companies that write programs for editing, for coloring, for grading, for all kind of, they all are able to handle the new footage because also initially, um, before the camera comes out, all these companies already get the white papers and they can implement this stuff even before the camera starts shipping. And we had already one software update before, um, 1.1, and there's another one coming, hopefully tomorrow. And then also that will, the biggest thing that comes is that this, this um, thing will turn into a touch screen where you can actually touch, right? So this is not yet there. It's one of the biggest things that people, some people like it and some people don't, but you can turn it off. And then lots of information is always online. We make, uh, we have, uh, have colleagues in Munich that are always making these cool tech talk videos. You know, Sean Dooley, uh, he moved to Munich now. He's an Australian um, marketing specialist. He has tech talks about matte boxes, about motors, about uh, so many things. And it's, it's uh, more and more videos there that you can watch and you can repeat. You can stop and pause because, uh, yeah. And that brings me to the end here. Any questions? <laughs> so I haven't showed you some of these clips because um, the textures, for example, is this no visible? I guess I gotta get out of here. If you wanted to see the texture here. So uh, this is kind of in motion, the same thing that you saw before, but you might have to get up to see actually what it looks like. So um, because it's different when you just look at a still, right? Versus you have something that you actually see it's actually live. 
You know, so it's still now, but it's going to go, it's going to start playing. Now it's playing. No, because um, there are image manipulations you can do, obviously. But right. let's say if you have fine micro contrast, right, or fine uh, or high contrast for micro, you couldn't take it away later, right? Yeah. Or if you have low contrast, I mean, maybe you could crank that up somehow. But um, it's all these things are basically happening in this chain before we even get to the raw part, where we say, okay, now this is raw, it hasn't debayed yet, it's still individual, either red, green, or blue pixels, but they, are, they have that character, right? So, um, again, maybe this one, again, there's one that's shadow, there's one that's deep shadow, and again, there's different strength, and sometimes people ask for different things and also combining different things. I think on my camera, I don't have it turned on. There is also, there's a few online that you can also combine something with some other textures. And you see, I don't know if you can see on the, the difference now. I mean, you see kind of the, the grain dancing around, right? And you see the color randomly changing. So this is even more, it, des it desaturates more of the noise. So if it blows up, can you see it? So once it starts playing, now. It's hard to see from where you guys are, but maybe you see. So the default would be that five level in the grain? Yes, I mean, it's kind of, uh, exactly. If you don't do anything to yeah. it, I mean, it's- it less grain in the, the right edge. On the right. Yes, yeah, so it was also, but that, that was only, it wasn't doing denoising, it was just applying, it was taking the color out okay. of the noise. So that's why it's not so visible. And you see here also, this is, looks like film grain, but again, it's very strong. If you want stuff to look like this, yes, you can use the texture. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this one doesn't exist, by the way. So, um, <laughs> no, because there was barely any difference. We had m a few things in there, but it, it didn't really, it, there was no point in putting this in. So, um, let me see what else I have. Encounters, textures, go to siren. Oh yeah, so, and there is, by the way, a tech talk also, how to shim, right? So this is like a small five minute video, how he shows you how you shim this stuff, because there's different screws here on the back, right? You see, you notice these, these screws and this tool, you adjust the torque from very, very weak to very, very strong based on which screw you take out, right? So, because the, the screw for, um, for the LDS contact, you know, so this is where he adjusts it. The LDS contact is this little thing here. There's one screw here and one screw here. This is screwing into the electronic boards. And you don't want to apply a lot of torque to that one. And that's the one thing you have to be in mind. Because if you're adding a big shim underneath, your contacts will be too low. So the, the lens will not make any contact to the camera if you need the lens data, right? If you don't need lens data and you don't want to have any numbers here, then you don't need to shim that that portion with the with the with the contacts, but then you have no no lens data. Right? So that's the only thing that you have to kind of keep in mind. And this is a very simple process. You see, this is kind of where he takes these out. So and then he puts that shim there to be the same height, you know. And now it's done. Boom. Um, 
Yeah, so um, we have, I don't know, you guys can come over here and play a little bit around with this stuff. Good. Thanks for coming. Hey. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so, uh, the lighthouse swag bags are in the bag. You can have as you can have those. Ariel and brought two. You know. <laughs> um, so it was the second stop. Out. So, so uh, well, first of all, thanks for flying all the way from Germany yesterday. No, you, oh. you flew from where? No, from New York. New York. New York. No, so it wasn't uh, wasn't so far. He's he's amazing, and call, lean on him because he's he is. Uh, you can call him up. You can call up Ari, and they'll, direct, they'll send you directly to him. Uh, or at least every time I've called you, you've been there. So I, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't answer my, my phone, now it called twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. The other thing is, I figured out uh, uh, swag bag. So who's been in the industry um, the longest? I think that's the, that's the question. Nine, uh, nine, anybody before 80, 85? <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, Alan, I think you're the winner. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then the newbie. So you're just, you guys are starting out so you can fight between it. All right. So you'll, you'll get the next one. Yeah. All right. Um, I, what else? I appreciate y'all coming. Um, Chris in the back. Chris Benopel. Right here. Oh, right here. To the right. Um, he is a rental manager, so if you need anything at all, uh, we are in business, even though there's a strike, so we s supply rentals to indies or commercials or whatever, so please call on us. Uh, lean on us, too. We're really a, uh, we want to be re a resource in town, in Wilmington, for you. We're not going anywhere. Um, Chris has got a call if you need help renting equipment. Um, so if you want to come up and play, feel free. Yeah. Yeah? Thank you, Gunter. Appreciate you. Thank you.